is Asian Insider and I'm Nirmal Ghosh. Now, at the time of this conversation, the new coronavirus, which emerged out of Wuhan in China, has infected more than 37,000 people worldwide, with most cases in China, and it has killed over 1,000. Again, all but two so far in China. Joining me today is Laurie Garrett, a former senior fellow for global health at the Council for Foreign Relations, who has won Polk Awards, a Peabody Award, and a Pulitzer for her science writing. Her books include The Coming Plague and Ebola and the Betrayal of Trust, which is about what she calls the collapse of public health. Now, Laurie was on the ground in China during the SARS outbreak back in 2003. Laurie, thank you very much for sparing your time for us this evening. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Laurie. So we now have some new figures in terms of mortality rates, and they seem to range from 4 to 5 percent in Hubei in China, which is pretty concerning. But some experts say it could be higher in China because they did not have adequate facilities to deal with the large volume of patients. But even if one assumes an eventual, say, 2 percent mortality rate globally, that places this in the same region as the 1918 Spanish flu, which killed 50 million plus. What is your take on this going forward from what we know so far? Well, I don't want to sound alarmist, and especially given what's going on in Singapore right now, I don't want to say anything that would frighten people, but I do think this is a very serious epidemic, and perhaps one of the most serious challenges we have faced in uh, at least two or three decades. I would liken it to a high-speed version of what HIV looked like in the 1980s, uh, in the early days when we were seeing it spreading very rapidly in the gay communities around the world, but not terribly rapidly elsewhere. And there was a tendency to write it off, ignore it and say, well, compared to flu, this is nothing compared to fill in the blank. It's nothing. But of course, look where we are today with HIV AIDS as one of the three great pandemics in the history of our species. Right. So China has drawn praise for its swift response in identifying the virus very early, sharing its genomic sequence and all that. But otherwise, the political system, the same one that enables a hospital to be built in a matter of days, basically covered up the emergence for several crucial days. And we have the absolutely tragic case, of course, of the whistleblower. You have spoken and written of the climate of fear in China, which leads to junior and mid-level officials not wanting to give their bosses bad news. And you were on the ground in China back in 2003. Is anything different around, uh, this time around? Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of differences and they're not good. The first is that, you know, China's doing the Belt and Road Initiative, which means huge indebtedness as a nation, um, digging deep into their coffers in order to finance this massive infrastructure effort all over the world. Um, that gives them less economic resilience than they actually had in 2003 against the loss of income uh, from the shutdown of businesses, from the shutdown of trade, and so on. The second is this time, because of the Belt and Road, there's a greater risk of spread to countries that were spared from SARS. And in particular, of course, I'm very concerned about the Central Asian countries and Sub-Saharan African countries that are on the Belt and Road. Um, the third big difference is that uh, Xi is locked in a trade war with Trump. And this has really hurt their economy. It's, it's brought a lot of things to dangerous points uh, politically and economically. Doesn't help at all to have that in the background. The fourth thing is there is at the same time, well, there are two big animal epidemics going on. The uh, uh, African swine fever epidemic, which has wiped out about half of all the pigs in China, and then H5N1 influenza, the bird flu, has returned, which is incredibly lethal to birds. And we're seeing mass die-offs of uh, domesticated chickens and ducks. Now, what the reason that's significant is that here we are in an economic problem. We're putting people in lockdown, you know, up to 100 million people in some form of a lockdown, greatly cut back on the movement of goods and services. Uh, stores are emptying out of goods. What's the protein source as we go forward? What are people eating if chickens, ducks, and pigs are all being affected and eggs are in short supply? Um, and then I think the final, the fifth big difference between this and SARS is the politics in China today. 
Xi has consolidated the most power any leader in China has had since Mao Zedong. He has created an infrastructure throughout China that's quite different from what was in place with SARS. With SARS, as an outsider, our big confusion was, you know, here's a guy sitting in the back of the room, and he has some innocuous title. And here's a guy sitting in the front of the room, and he's called the minister of something or other, you know, or the mayor or the the head of the local CDC or whatever. And you don't know which guy is actually more powerful. The guy sitting in the back of the room turns out to be the party official. And yes, he's more powerful. So in 2003, you had a kind of shadow government. You had the the part of the government that was the party and the part of the government that was the official titled individuals. What Xi has done is consolidate them more so that really the government is the party and the party is the government. And what that means is that there's a lot at stake now for Xi and for the CCP in making this epidemic come to a quick resolution for economic reasons, for political power reasons, um, and for really kind of the existential state of mass support for the party. And when you look at the outcry that's come out since Lee died and Uh you see you see videos of people shouting out their windows in Wuhan, grieving and mourning for Li, and also shouting denunciations of the Communist Party, singing the Barricades song from Les Miserables, the play. I mean, it's it's shattering. Some Ch- uh, China experts tell me this is the greatest challenge the leadership has ever faced, and it's sort of been likened to the Chernobyl moment for Mikhail uh-huh. Gorbachev and the Soviet Union. Right, fascinating. Now, China has announced a ban on wildlife in wet markets. Originally, it was a temporary ban, which we'd seen before. Now they say it's, it's going to be permanent. But again, so we've seen this before. Do you think it will be sustained this time around? You know, I, I think I've now been through at least five rounds of the Chinese government claiming they were shutting down the wet markets. And they shut down for the duration of an epidemic and then they all start reopening again. I think it's really tough. I mean, one big consideration is who has refrigerators. It's really hard to buy packaged chopped meat from a supermarket the way we do in the West if you don't have a refrigerator to put them in when you get home. And if every single Chinese household had a state-of-the-art refrigerator, that would have quite a significant impact on climate change. So we have a lot of trade-offs to consider. And of course, there is the the general issue of wanting very, very, very fresh meat, meaning it's alive when you take it home. And that's a a deep cultural tradition. Uh So how well is the United States equipped to deal with the spread of this new coronavirus, in your estimation? (laughs) I'm quite worried. Uh, In Uh fact, just today, the Trump White House released their new budget proposal for fiscal year 2021, which would start in September of this year. And uh, they're, they're looking at cutting our Centers for Disease Control even more, cutting our epidemic response capacity even more. He's already made huge cuts, so severe that pretty much the entire infrastructure across the United States that was set up in response to Ebola in 2014 by uh, Barack Obama has been eliminated, including um, an office of epidemic preparedness that was inside of our National Security Council, a similar office that was in our Department of Homeland Security. Um, and you know now they're scrambling to try and put something together that they can call an epidemic response capacity. But really, everything's resting on the shoulders of our CDC, which uh-huh. wouldn't sound bad unless you understood the legal system and realized the CDC is a pretty powerless agency. It can't tell another part of the federal government what to do, and it can't go into a state without the state's approval. Mm. Now, I know that a lot of labs and a lot of scientists are working on a vaccine. There's a group in Singapore which is working on it. How long typically does it take to develop a vaccine? It has to go through human testing and all that. What is your prognosis on that? Well, I would just remind everybody, and folks in Singapore don't need to be reminded, I don't think, that ever since 2003 in SARS, the world has been working on a SARS vaccine, and we don't have one. 
Okay, well, that short and not that uh, not that hopeful. But anyway, um, last quick question. You know, you said in a recent article in Foreign Policy, you, you listed some basic precautions one can take, and you mentioned wearing gloves in particular and not dipping into a communal plate, as is the case in places like, like Singapore and, of course, China. And Singapore, as we know, as you've mentioned, has the most number of cases outside China. What would you advise Singaporeans in this instance, in this case? Well, I don't know if people are following the story of the hot pot family in Hong Kong, but there has been a small cluster of cases involving a family that ate together, you know, with chopsticks going into a common hot pot. And now they are a cluster of cases. This is very dangerous. I realize that it's rude, you know, to go to somebody's home or to go home to your own family, be offered the opportunity of sharing a meal and to say, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not putting my utensils, my chopsticks in that common pot. I realize that that's rude, but right now you need to be rude. Right now you need to insist, no, 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 please give me a large spoon. Let me scoop out a serving for myself onto a separate plate, put the large spoon back, and now I use my chopsticks to eat from my plate. And that I think it's absolutely essential that everybody think, well, the way I like to put it is about half of all common colds are coronaviruses. So they're in the same family with this very dangerous virus. If you think about how fast a common cold spreads in your household when your four-year-old comes home from nursery school and coughing and sneezing and how hard it is to not have the whole family get infected, or another example at the office, the one guy who comes back from his vacation sniffling and sneezing, and within days, the whole office is sniffling and sneezing. That tells you something about how quickly coronaviruses can spread, and by uh, multiple different ways, you know, coughing, sneezing, your hands, a uh, common shared surface, picking up your cell phone and saying, hey, Charlie, take a look at this, and handing your phone which then he puts his hands on where yours have just been, and whoa. Um, I think that the best way to try and imagine protecting yourself is to imagine something not quite so scary, but trying to protect yourself and your household and your office and your school from a common cold spreading. And if you can think of what precautions protect you from a common cold, you'll be in much better shape protecting yourself from getting infected with this new virus. So what is that? It's hand washing all the time, just constantly. Wearing gloves when you're outside, uh, any place where you're likely to touch a common surface, a banister, a doorknob, uh, you know, a subway pole. Uh, it's important to protect yourself from those surfaces. And similarly, if you are coughing, sneezing, what have you. It's your social responsibility to protect those around you by wearing a mask, by wearing gloves and not touching common surfaces as if possible. Frankly, you should stay home <laughs> and just not have contact with people. Inside the household, um, it's very, very important that anything that is moist, that touches your hands, be separated to be exclusively for each individual household member. One of the best ways to spread a common cold in a household is by sharing towels. You know, whether they're kitchen towels or bathroom towels, um, uh -huh. you know, they're, they're moist and they're just wonderful growth colonies, uh, sites for, for viruses. And uh, I think you need to really go through the checklist in your mind. Watch, watch your children. Watch everything that they stick in their mouth, because that's what kids do. Watch how little they ever wash their hands and how poorly they wash them when they do. Now's the time to teach them some really tough habits and to think about them for yourself. Do you really take the right, right kinds of hygiene practices and habits? And then I think the kitchen, you just have to realize that the kitchen is full of potential points of transmission. And you, you have to really start thinking carefully. How do we cook in the kitchen? Who touches what in the kitchen? How do you present food? How do you serve it? How do you eat it? Um, to just greatly reduce all points of shared contact. 
um, so that the household is safe. And right. one last thing, one, one last uh -huh. thing I would suggest, you know, in Singapore, it's nice and warm, so you don't have to worry about keeping your windows open. And this is a good time to keep windows open and get a lot of air circulation in your home, um, especially if one person in the household or in the office is coughing, sneezing, feeling a little weak, a little tired, maybe a little bit dizzy, um, and of course, breathing with difficulty. Right, right, right. Thank you very much for that. Laurie Garrett, thank you for your time this evening. I know you're very busy. Thank you. Be well, Singapore. An interesting point emerging from the data is that the highest mortality seems to be among older males in China. And Laurie and others have pointed out that China has also the highest male smoker rate in the world. So clearly, if one has somewhat compromised lungs, one is way more susceptible. That may well be a critical factor to keep in mind as well. For Asian Insider, I'm Nirmal Ghosh.